Thank you, Peter, for your leadership in Illinois and beyond. You have assembled a mighty team to bring this event to our viewers. Hopefully you, our viewers, enjoyed a moment of peace and relaxation during our break because we are about to head into another intense discussion. This next session moves away from the themes of journalism that we discussed earlier and focuses on something many of us think of as non-traditional media, social media. Platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok are responsible in a significant way for influencing the words we speak and those we believe. Our next moderator has spent her career examining the intersection of media, technology, and social justice. Eileen Guo is senior reporter for tech policy, ethics, and social issues at MIT Technology Review. We are grateful to have her lead this discussion. Welcome, Eileen. Okay. Um, thank you, Jim. I'm very happy to be here today as part of today's program um, and to be talking about these topics, which are ones that I think I think about a lot, both as a journalist covering technology and as someone that's just in the world <laughs> living with technology. So before we get started with this really great session, I want to challenge everyone that's tuning in to um, put down your devices for the next 45 minutes. Um, and don't look at Facebook, don't look at Instagram, try to ignore your notifications, text messages, all of that. Um, not just because I want you to pay attention to us, but because I want you to think about how difficult it is and how addictive social media has become as we have this conversation about social media and mental health. Um, so I want to start off by setting the context. So in September 2020, Netflix released a docudrama, The Social Dilemma, which features both social media creators as well as experts in mental health practitioners who discuss the psychological impact of many of these technologies on psychology. And our panelists today were featured in the film. First is Dr. Anna Lemke. Um, Dr. Lemke is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. She's the medical director of Stanford Addiction Medicine, the program director for the Stanford Addiction Medicine Fellowship, and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. She also has a new book out uh, called Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. Um, we also have with us today Dr. Jonathan Haidt, a social, a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and taught for 16 years in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. Dr. Haidt is the author of The Happiness Hypotheses, uh, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom, and two New York Times bestsellers, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. And finally, we have um, Renee DeResta, a highly regarded expert on misinformation, media, and trust. She's the technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory, a cross-disciplinary program of research, teaching, and policy engagement for the study of abuse in current information technologies. And Renee was also a founding advisor to the Center for Humane Technology and is the author of The Hardware Startup, Building Your Product, Business, and Brand. Welcome, everyone. So let's get started. Um, Anna, I want to start with you. Um, it's kind of a known fact now. Everyone talks about how social media is addictive. But what does that actually mean? Um, and what does it mean to become addicted to devices and platforms? What it means is that the substance or the behavior releases large amounts of dopamine in the brain's reward pathway. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Um, it's not the only neurotransmitter involved in reward, but it's probably the most important one. And it is the final common pathway for almost all drugs. And when we are becoming addicted to something, essentially what happens is that huge spike of dopamine as a result of that substance or behavior um, is something that our brain immediately adapts to by downregulating our own dopamine transmission and downregulating our own dopamine production. And this is called neuroadaptation. 
But in the process of neuroadaptation, we lower our dopamine levels, not just to tonic baselines, but actually below those tonic baselines. So we go into a dopamine deficit state. Now, after one use of an addictive drug, we pretty quickly resolve that and return to baseline dopamine release. But with repeated use over hours to days to months to years, what we essentially end up with is a kind of a chronic dopamine deficit state such that we then need to use our substance just to get out of that deficit and feel normal. And when we're not using that substance, we experience the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and persistent intrusive thoughts of using our drug, otherwise known as craving. So I think a way to open this conversation with our kids, for example, is to acknowledge that many of these social media apps are drugified. They have intentionally been turned into drugs by making them infinite in quantity, incredibly potent, and full of novelty. And then all of the alerts and the bottomless bowls and the likes and the enumeration are basically triggers that lead to a little minor dopamine spike above baseline followed very quickly by a dopamine deficit, which leads to craving, which leads to the behaviors that motivate us to go out and get that drug. And once we get it, we get the great big spike of dopamine, but that wears off over time. So that's essentially what happens in the brain. It starts out being reinforcing, but with repeated use, we end up in this dopamine deficit state. And what we're talking about there is really like any notification that you're getting, any interaction with social media, is that right? Absolutely. And again, the key there is it's, it's like Pavlov's dogs, right? So Pavlov discovered that not only will dogs salivate when you give them a slab of meat, they will salivate when they see the light that, they, that, that tells them that that slab of meat is coming. So if we're on our devices and we get a little bit of alert, we get a little mini spike of dopamine. So already that is reinforcing, but it's followed immediately by a dopamine deficit state below tonic baseline. So then we're craving, and then we have the compulsion to go seek out or see the thing that the alert notifies us about. So it is this continuous cycle of fluctuating dopamine that drives the compulsive aspect of it. Also, the bottomless bowls are part of it. We all have the desire to complete a task. And so it's the we're searching for that dopamine that we get when we complete it, of course, with a bottomless bowl. We never get there. Also, what I think is really fascinating is enumerating things or giving, giving them a number, whether it's your rank in a video game or its number of likes or it's the rank of your book on Amazon, um, can be very, very reinforcing, or the opposite, you know, can be very um, demoralizing, depending upon which way those numbers are going. So I, I'm glad that you ended with that point on enumeration, because I, I have a follow-up question for Jonathan, which is, you, you wrote in one of your articles that the problem might not be connectivity itself, but rather the way social media turns so much communication into a public performance. And I, I feel like that point about the gamification and all of that really speaks to that. So I wanted to ask you, what are the implications of really performing as opposed to communicating? And what does that mean, especially for our mental health? Yeah. No, thank you, Eileen. And it's great to go right after after Anna. Um, you know, Anna gives us the, the neuroscience, but what's happening in the neurons and the synapses. One level up from that is this is the psychology. And I'm a social psychologist. Um, I'm very interested in how we influence each other, how understandings emerge. Uh, you know, we, we co-create a sort of a, a moral matrix and then we live in this matrix together. And what I think has happened is that around 2012, when teenagers in particular, you know, they were not mostly on social media every day in 2010, but in 2012, 2013, they were. Complete transformation of the nature of teen social life. At the time, I remember thinking, you know, I was looking at like what they were tweeting and what they were posting and it was like, look, here's my hamburger from today. And I thought this is really trivial, but you know what? Maybe it'll be really good. Like maybe they'll be so immersed in all these little social connections they'll be like super socially smart beyond anything that has ever happened in human history. Like it might work out really well. Well, it didn't. The, the results, what we now know about teen mental health is, is, is completely disastrous. And that's what we talked about in The Social Dilemma. 
starting right around 2012, you see the, the rates of depression and anxiety, they were pretty constant for at least a decade before for the millennials. But as Gen Z, that is kids born in, in uh, 1996 or so or, or after, once they become the teenagers, the rate for boys on, um, on depression, anxiety goes up substantially. And the rate for girls is like a hockey stick. It goes way, way up starting right around 2012. It's not a gradual lineup. It's a hockey stick. And so I think what has happened is if we were just connecting kids like, hey, here's a free telephone line. You can talk to anyone in the world one on one. That I think would probably be really good. But it's not that. Social media is you talk at somebody, but that's just one person. What you're really concerned about is the dozens or hundreds of people that are rating you. And it's those little ratings. It's the like button. It's the shares. It's the follows. Those are the little dopamine hits that Anna was talking about. And if you think about it, would you, you know, it's hard enough to train your kid to be polite and clear his plate after dinner and say thank you. Like, you know, we work on that for years and years. Now, imagine if you turned over your kid's behavior to the social media companies and they could train your kid a thousand times faster than you because they can give the reward within seconds of the behavior. And that, I think, is what's happened. We've turned our kids in particular over to a giant machine. I'm not saying it was necessarily nefarious, but it has resulted in uh, our kids getting trained. They don't learn how to communicate. They have trouble making friends. They often don't know how to talk to someone face to face. They run back to the app to communicate with the person. And I think this is why we, they're not having normal human childhoods. They're not learning the basic skills they need and, and they're in big trouble. And Renee, I, I wanna take what Jonathan just talked about and kind of expand it a little bit. A lot of your focus in research is on community building and, and kind of really the dark sides of that with radicalization um, at, or dark or most extreme side, perhaps. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask, is there is there a link between these mental health issues um, and the the feedback that that kids and teenagers are getting and what you study? Yeah, well, I think the work that we do is a little bit different um, than the work that Anna and John do in that we are looking not so much at the impact on the individual, but we're looking at understanding uh, the internet ecosystem, how information moves across it, how people form communities within it. Um, sometimes those communities are very structured in the sense that they join a Facebook group where there's a persistence to it. Um, sometimes it's kind of an emergent behavior. People just sort of come together around a particular topic. Sometimes we experience that as a sort of spontaneity. You know, a new hashtag appears in our trending feed. We click in, we're interested, and all of a sudden we have a whole new community of people who are right there with us um, who are equally captivated by this thing and they want to talk about it too. And so you have this sort of self-assembling um, community. Uh, sometimes it becomes a little bit more of a, you know, um, a little bit more of, a, of, a, of an angry crowd. That's unfortunately one of the dynamics that we see quite often. There's a lot of sensationalism. There's a lot of anger. And so whether it's in a persistent community or one of these more transient things where people come together to talk about a particular moment in time, they're there because they're having a strong emotional response to what they're seeing. And one of the areas where this has been really clear is um, hashtags and conversations related to coronavirus, just to use something that's you know that we've all spent um, the last year and a half thinking about. In the movie, The Social Dilemma, you see um, the teenage boy character and whenever he is feeling um, lonely or insecure or confused, or even when he's just kind of by himself killing time, he goes and he pulls out his phone and he's sort of constantly signaling what he's interested in. Um, there's a lot of that that's been happening, particularly in the context of COVID, where we've all been looking for more and more information about coronavirus. In the early days, it was uh, how dangerous was it? Um, who was being harmed by it? Were there early cures? As the vaccine conversation has started, um, more about uh, the efficacy and the safety of the vaccines, then um, you know the expansion of that conversation into now we're in the mandate phase of the conversation. And there's a lot of people who have very, very strong opinions about these things, and they're finding the very like-minded. And oftentimes, it's just a perfectly normal, natural, you know, there's nothing remotely radical about it. But there are certain types of content, and there are certain dynamics between these uh, self-assembling crowds and these communities of people oftentimes, and then things like the media. This is where social media and media intersect, where they don't know who to trust. They're very confused. You know, this has been a very confusing time for many, many people. Um, I'm a parent trying to figure out how safe it is for my child to go to school, right? And so as we're going through and scrolling and looking for information, feeling that overwhelming sense of there's just too much here, I don't know what to do with it, I don't know who to trust, 
has created these environments where people want to be in these communities of trust. And oftentimes that's people who tend to agree with them. So we see a lot of that, um, that consolidation, that sort of breaking up into what are, um, you know, sometimes they're called echo chambers. An echo chamber means usually a community of people who actively distrust outsiders. Sometimes there are just communities, you know, with, with shared beliefs. But where we see that evolve into areas of harm is when they actively distrust outsiders and when the information that they're receiving from the people that they do trust is not necessarily reputable. So this is where we start to get into conversations around what is a harmful community, what are harmful behaviors, what are the harmful effects of social media in this regard, um, versus how do we think about the opportunity for positive or pro-social dynamics to come out of the same system, which is people finding, for example, support groups, or there's a lot of really interesting people who have had a COVID experience and have long COVID. And there's a lot of these long COVID communities that are really actively trying to communicate to figure out, hey, what works for you? And so it's, it's not quite so simple as um, the entire ecosystem is terrible. It, there's a lot more nuance to it that, that, we, that we see in our work as we look at it uh, writ large at a, at a social level. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to tie like a couple of different ideas together. And I, I'm thinking one thing that stuck out, stuck out to me about what you just said is that there's a lot of fear that's driving um, interactions and the building of communities and, and all of that. And on the other hand, there's fear and there's also vulnerability and, and support. Um, and, and a big part of this conference, I think what we're thinking about is how do we break down like stigma and discrimination around some of these vulnerabilities around whether it's mental health or distrust of you know the media and authority and all of that and and i'm curious um and this is a question for for everyone but maybe anna we can start with you how you see social media either providing that space um to you know decrease discrimination and stigma, or if there are ways that it's actually making it worse? Yeah, great question. Um, co complicated question for, for me to answer. I mean, when I think about um, behaviors or ideas that are stigmatized, um, really what I, what I conceptualize is that we as human groups are constantly redefining the boundaries of deviance. And we do that in an iterative way. And one of the main emotions that we use to do that is, is simple shame. Shame is an incredibly powerful emotion. We feel it viscerally in our gut. We associate it with fears of shunning and abandonment, um, being ejected from our tribe. It's a very, very powerful emotion. And it can be very pro-social um, in terms of um, bringing people around to more pro-social and adaptive behaviors that contribute to what behavioral economists call club goods. On the other hand, it can be a very destructive emotion, especially if it involves you know, being shunned or, or as we talk about now, canceled. Um, you know, when I'm listening to Renee talk, what, what strikes me about, about one of the wonderful things about social media now is the incredible egalitarian nature of it and how so many people who are unvoiced and had no platform now have not just a platform to articulate their, their ideas, but can also find other people who share their, those ideas. And sort of on the opposite side of shame is the incredible validation that we feel when, when we find other people who have had a similar experience or share our worldview or share ideas that Maybe we were ashamed of expressing or felt that we were the only ones. So, so again, it's a really, it's a really um, you know, double-edged sword because I think it's great the way social media has allowed certain marginalized people um, who have been stigmatized and not welcome. Um, it, it's created a, a place and a platform for them to find others. Um, on the other hand, the potential danger there is the ways in which this finding of others is, is no longer happening in the village square. It's happening at entirely separate villages. And we're not talking about small villages. We're talking about villages of millions of people all around the world. And I really think that our you know, basic emotional network was not adapted 
to millions of people. So the scale is something that is just not um, not something that we're we're prepared for. I mean, we go quickly from the village square to the village mosh pit and, you know, passing people around on their backs. And then what's happening as, you know, as Renee alluded to is that it's basically, you know, a herd mentality or a frenzy Um, getting back to dopamine. We experience an incredible dopamine spike when we have an emotion at the same time that somebody else is having the same emotion. So, you know, people are having outrage and then a million other people are outraged at the same time. And then any kind of rational discourse becomes obscured by sort of, you know, the mosh pit frenzy. So, so it, it, this is hard for me to answer because I think on the one hand, you know, social media has allowed for people to be seen and to have a voice in really positive ways, but the scale of it and the way in which this emotion-driven aspect of it comes to dominate any kind of rational discourse um, is potentially very destructive, very polarizing, and very discriminating. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that, um, if I if I may. Um, so those of us who were socialized by the 20th century uh, really understand, I think, the mission of the Kennedy Forum and part of it being to destigmatize mental illness. It, it, mental illness is so common. And I remember you know, growing up in the 70s, it was a really big deal if somebody was found to have gone to a psychiatrist. Oh, my God, like that person can't be president. Um, so since the 60s and 70s, there's been enormous progress in destigmatizing um, mental illness and the need for psychiatric or psychological care. Now, one of the hallmarks of the, of the social media era, and here I, I, I identify around 2012 is really the turning point. Before then, I called the pre-babble time. That was a time when we could, there was some possibility of us understanding each other. Uh, in the Tower of Babel story, God says, let us go down and confound their language so that they may not understand each other. And I think that's what social media did to us around 2012 plus or minus a couple of years when we got this outrage platform. Since then, we have all these separate communities that are untethered from each other and untethered from reality. And there's no way I can see to retether them. And this is our fate. The reason I bring it up in this conversation about stigma is that there are some sub-communities flying out into orbit uh, in which uh, mental illness is now valorized. Um, I've heard from a number of teenage girls, and I'm referring specifically to teenage girls. I've spoken to a number of teenage girls who say, I'm not depressed, but I have to pretend that I am because everyone else is, and I I don't want to make them feel bad. You know, being anxious and depressed is something you brought, social media encourages it. I wouldn't say social media encourages it, period, in certain communities that have a very particular moral order. And it's especially ones that have ideas about oppression and victimization. It's valorized to be a victim, to be suffering, to be anxious, to be depressed. And this is terrible. This is just a terrible thing. Because if you use labels to describe yourself and you you know assume a virtue if you have it not, as, as Shakespeare says in Hamlet, um, one of the reasons why teenage girls, especially girls on the left, girls who are political on the left are much more depressed than anyone else. And I think it's because they have these communities that valorize suffering, oppression, and mental illness. So yes, we want to destigmatize, but I don't think we want to valorize it. We don't want to make it heroic or good or prestigious to be anxious and depressed. And, and some communities, I think that has happened, but I'd love to hear from, from the others if, if, if you think that's not the case. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would attribute this trend to social media per se. I mean, I think this is a trend that has been evolving over the last 30 to 50 years. Uh, the way in which we medicalize all kinds of social problems and the way that people now essentially build identity through a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, it, it could be that, you know, the phenomenon is being accelerated or communities are being built around, um, you know, this, this sort of medicalized, uh, um, you know, pathologized identity, essentially. Um, but I, I guess I would, and, and I think you're making a further point, um, you know, w- what is the utility of, of such an identity? I mean, I think on the positive side, what we have is more of a normalization of um, this kind of internal struggling um, which could potentially encourage people to get the help that they need. Um, but, but 
but I agree with you that that one of the dangers there is that people can get stuck in this identity um, and then not really move to forward in their lives, not not create a healing narrative because their identity and their narrative is so contingent on them having this you know illness narrative. So um, so I, I, I do appreciate your point. Well, we see is a little bit of um, for any for any topic. Um, I'll use the example of the hashtag trauma on TikTok. Um, there's a there's a lot of people who are out there who are creating content because we're all content creators now. And so this is people who are sharing their first person experiences. They're joining a community. Um, when you engage with it, you see more of it. And so there is a, a kind of like a, a, a reinforcement um, that this is content. You contribute to this hashtag, ergo, you're probably interested in this topic, ergo, you're going to see more of it. Um, and that is one of the dynamics that after you've, you know, sort of trained the recommender system, uh, once you're, again, regardless of what the topic is, um, that sort of feedback loop does kind of come into play. So if you are, um, for, I think, one of the ways in which this has been somewhat remarkable um, in social media at large is that you find your kind of communities of affinity and, and many of those are very much identity based. And, and so people continue to internalize um, the messages that they see as they participate in these communities that are very focused on their identities. And uh, this is one of the, it's one of the dynamics of how the system serves content. Yeah, I, I guess I want to jump in and, and add, you know, um, that these can be very healing communities. So for example, in the addiction recovery community, these online platforms, including, you know, classic social media platforms like Instagram can be very helpful. I, I just saw a patient um, yesterday who is in recovery from an alcohol addiction, who when she experiences cravings for alcohol will go on her Instagram feed where she follows a number of other women who are in recovery. Um, and, and not only is it sustaining and healing for her in terms of her recovery to be able to do that and get those positive messages, not just of a shared identity, but also practical tips for how to maintain recovery, but they themselves have become a powerful platform. She told me how recently some orange juice ad advertised to moms that they should get this orange juice so that they could you know, make mimosas in their hiding in their closet to make mimosas, which is horrible in many ways. You know, it sends the message that, you know, moms need to be intoxicated to be able to endure parenting and that hiding in your closet to mix a drink is okay. So what her Instagram community did was they came together and they protested against that ad and they were able to get it taken down. So again, we, we need to remember um, the, the positive aspects of these. And I don't think it's, it's not the app itself. It's not the, you know, all communities. What we need to figure out is what are the distinctions between healing communities and those that are not, you know, what are the ingredients there? That's a really great segue. I, um, to talk about maybe some of the ways that social media can be a positive force. And I, I'd love to hear from everyone a little bit more on that. Well, I mean, I just shared that vignette, but one of the things, I mean, I think again about teenagers and, you know, I have a, a, a group of my own um, and, you know, naturally I'm, I'm, I'm alarmed about the amount of time that they spend on their phones and on their screens. On the other hand, um, something interesting is happening there that is potentially positive. And I'd, I'd really be curious to hear what other others think. And um, what I see is positive, potentially positive, is that, um, I mean, so much of modern life is this coming together and then separating again, which I think is very traumatic and, 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 and engenders a lot of neuroses, like the constant separation anxiety. So for example, when I go to work in the morning, I have some separation anxiety leaving my kids. When I leave work at the end of the day, I feel separation anxiety leaving my patients. And then I often want to call home and bridge that gap because I'm anxious for that period. Okay, whatever you may think of that, that's my reality. And I really think that this, the ways in which home life and work are separated is probably not fundamentally healthy. And so I'm wondering if there are ways which, in which families and friendship groups can stay more connected even as we separate. Because I do see that with my kids and their friends. They're real friends in real life. And they're talking together almost always through the day, even as they're not together. 
I see that as something potentially positive. I can see a lot of potential positives and a lot of potential negatives, um, but I'd like to step back and think about the, the mammalian developmental program. Our kids are mammals, and that means that they have an attachment system to us. And, and when they feel secure, then they're supposed to go out in the world and take risks and try things. And if things don't go well, then they come back, but then they have the courage to go out again. And this is how mammals learn. And you can't have your young mammal develop into adulthood if they don't do that. If they just sit at home all day long on their screen or they go to school, or if they're not out there with other kids having adventures and taking risks, and you might think, well, risks on social media, maybe those are okay. No, risks on social media are horrible because if those go bad, they can lead to mass shaming at the end of your career because you said something. So um, I would like to suggest that we not even bother looking for, well, what's good, what's bad. We rather say, you know what? Um, this was a giant uncontrolled experiment, and so far the results are about as catastrophic as anything we've ever seen with children, with the possible exception of leaded gas. I'm not sure. We, those are the two giant ones in, in my lifetime. Um, so um, given that the age of 13 was chosen by Congress for no good reason as the age at which kids can contract to give away their data, there was no concern for mental health. It was just a political compromise. Um, that age turns out to be way too low, and it is never enforced. Uh, you can just lie on any of these social media platforms. When my kids were in sixth grade, they said everyone is on Instagram. So rather than saying what's good, what's bad, I would like to say having kids skip normal childhood interactions and instead spend, spend eight hours a day like this, even if they're communicating, appears to be disastrous. I can't be sure of that, but we have this mental health catastrophe. Nobody has another explanation for it. Nobody has proposed, well, no, it's not because of social media, it's because of something else. No one's offered that yet. So I think the leading candidate has to be the transformation of teen social life that happened when they stopped talking to each other face to face and started talking to each other through these mediated platforms with a thousand people training them with likes. This is really, really unhealthy. So I'd like to suggest that we have a national attempt to keep it out of elementary and middle school. I mean, I understand we're not going to keep 16 year olds off, but I think 11, 12 year olds, 10 year olds, they should not be on any of these ever. I mean, okay, maybe you can view things, but they should not be able to post. That's what's so damning. You post and then the world trains you. Kids should not be posting, I think, at least until 14, 15. High school's kind of a break point. I'm not going to tell high school students they can't have a TikTok account. But for God's sakes, keep it out of middle school. Middle school is, is the hardest part of life for most kids. It's especially for teen, for girls. I mean, middle school is awful for girls. My daughter is now, is going to seventh grade. Um, and to make it 10 times worse because now everyone's on Instagram. So let's not even look for the bright side here. I mean, the let's, let's just try to keep them off. And you can't just take your daughter off because then she's isolated. So it's a social dilemma. That was the point of the of the of the of the documentary. It's a social dilemma. We need legislation, norms, leadership from our middle school principals to try to set the norm. Parents, no Instagram. Do not let your kid have Instagram or any other uh, platform. Uh, wait until high school. Yeah, I basically agree with that. That we should keep our kids off of screens. I would go go further and say I don't think they should be viewing except with very close supervision until about, you know, until about age 12, 13. Um, so I, I, I do agree with that. And I also agree that both the corporations and the schools have a big responsibility here to, to create tech-free spaces and to help parents help their children. Um, so I, I, I absolutely agree with that. But I, I, I do think that the reality is that, you know, uh, this is here to stay. And so, um, when our kids eventually, when we have no more control over them, which is about, in my experience, about age 12, 13, 14, um, you know, at least we we want to educate them about how to use um, these these devices and, and these social media platforms um, so that they can, you know, arm themselves uh, to the best of their abilities against the, the harmful effects. I, I just want to just, just to make one one clarification here. Because, uh, Anna, you talked about screens. I'm not talking about screens. I mean, screens is an issue, and you're right that screens deliver reinforcement. But, you know, my my kids watch a lot of YouTube. Kids watch a lot of YouTube. YouTube doesn't do this. YouTube is not reinforcing you based on where your eyes are moving. Uh, there's no way we're going to keep kids off of videos or screens. I want my kids to be independent, and so I send them out in New York City with a cell phone. And I'm much more confident that they can go to school and do things independently at the age of 10 or 11 because they have a cell phone. 
Also, I've done a major review of all the published literature I can find on the relation between social media and mental health outcomes, and the results are pretty clear. These giant studies that look for correlations, if you're looking for correlations with screen time, they're not really there. If you're looking for correlations with social media, they are, and especially for girls. So if the challenge is, can we keep our kids off of screens until 14, 15? No, no way. I mean, look, most of us were on television for a lot of our childhoods, uh, but television and YouTube are not reinforcing you in the way that you talked about. Um, so let's, I, I want to really focus this on social media where you're a content creator, which means you're a brand manager for yourself. You don't have friends. You have people who you're trying to influence and you're trying to be like other influencers. I just have to add in this wonderful quote from my daughter who, after spending some time on TikTok last year, she said, daddy, it's so sad how, you know, like M Martin Luther King, he got famous for, for doing Martin Luther King but now the way to get famous is to wave your butt around on TikTok. And so the point is don't let kids be creating content that people rate. Don't let them do that. But having an iPhone or ha having access to videos, yeah, uh, that, the evidence does not support banning that. I disagree. I disagree. Okay, I think please. YouTube, video games, they're all a form potentially of social media. So kids watch YouTube and then they, then they comment and then they comment on the comments. When people play, play video games, they're on Discord at the same time interacting. So I would argue to not vilify social media as a separate category. All screens, all of these behaviors are potentially addictive if consumed in the wrong way or if, um, you know, if the algorithms um, manipulate us in a given way. They all have the potential to do that. And so I really think the mission is to look at all of it as potentially addictive and figure out how can we have a healthy relationship uh, with these various online media. Well, this is great. This is, I'm sorry, Renee, just, just, I, I, I'm so sorry. I know I'm blocking your time here. This is, this is, my kids are this like is... seven is my oldest. So I'm just like, okay. okay. <laughs> but, but, but I think what, what Anna points out maybe points us to a resolution here, which is kids talking on Discord, you talk and it's gone. That's okay. That's communication. It's content creation that stays and gets rated. That's what is so warping for our kids. So I would say you can't have an account on YouTube. You can't post content. You can't comment until you're 14. But so now, I, you so know, now as far that's, as I can... good, that's good, John, because now, I mean, now we're getting to the fine tuning. It's not really social media per se. It's the posting, the liking, the immediate reactions, the, you know, the, the incredible dissemination, the ratings, and, and, you know, that can happen in many different forums. So that's exactly what we need. And I mean, when you look at the studies on social media and mental health, frankly, in my opinion, they're not, the studies are okay. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not definitive. And you have this fundamental problem of the kids who are most vulnerable to the problems of online behaviors are kids who probably start out with some kind of co-occurring mental illness. I, I'm the first person to say that, you know, you can have no psychiatric disorder and you can get into serious trouble online as a teenager and develop depression and anxiety as a result. But again, our most vulnerable um, kids are the kids who are anyways vulnerable. And so, again, also thinking about different populations of kids and those who might be able to actually make good use of social media and those who are going to need a lot more help. We've just tried to steer him. Um, so, as I said, my, my oldest is seven, so we're not in the social media um, phase, but we are very much in the, you know, we had to block YouTube in part because it was more just... Um, it's very hard to filter. <laughs> that was the problem we were having. He learned how to search and he would just search with voice commands. And so he would just say a word and, you know, YouTube would be what would pop up and he couldn't type. He could barely read. He was, you know, five when he started doing this and, and we uninstalled the YouTube app and then he figured out he could do it through voice command and get through it through Safari. And, you know, kids are very innovative, right? And, but I grew up with computers constantly. And so what we tried to do, you know, my dad was an engineer. I had computers and I have snuck onto America online and BBS systems when I was in eighth grade, you know, and so we were trying to think through what could we do to not limit screens entirely. Also, candidly, I was homeschooling for the last year and a half and, and with a full-time job. And, and that's where parents really are. That's where parents of elementary school kids, you know, school kids, our experience in coronavirus was the only way we keep working is if our kid has a screen. And so what we tried to do was find things that were active. We were like, what kind of active, challenging, enriching things can we do with these things where 
there is, um, you know, not necessarily engaging in any way through chat or in any ability to communicate with a stranger or even other kids for that matter, besides like controlled Zooms. Um, but to say, were there ways in which we could encourage creativity? And one of the things that's been remarkable to me is even at seven, um, this idea that I want to be a content creator. They see people who are just like them um, or maybe a little older, you know, creating content. And so my son loves Minecraft. So he wants to watch people who make elaborate structures in Minecraft. And then he asks, when can I put my structure on YouTube? And we have to, you know, we kind of like dance around it. We haven't really wanted to get into all of the problems um, at the age of seven, but it is, this is such an innate thing that desire. I want to put my creativity, I want to put my content out into the world. And we're trying to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you balance that? Where is that, where's that line? If I could have him do it in a place where per Anna's comment, nobody could comment on it. And I didn't have to deal with the potential self-esteem hit of, you know, your Minecraft thing is garbage, you know, <laughs> um, or there was no way to see the download count, you know, or like whatever other metrics we set for ourselves. Um, then I would, then I think I would, uh, again, you know, feel more comfortable with it. But right now I think it is the, um, how do we recognize that screens can be very, very useful. A lot of these tools are absolutely fantastic. The, you know, Minecraft time is a time for creativity, um, but at the same time, limiting the, you know, the, the really bad downsides. And, and that's, I think we're all in agreement uh, on that front. Yeah. And that's a really nice line. You said it's an innate thing, but what's the innate thing? The innate thing is to, is to try, is to struggle for the prestige in the eyes of your peers. And at seven, that's not so serious, but once kids hit 10 or 11, they're totally obsessed with, or even earlier, what their friends think of them. They don't care what their parents think of them. And this was the point of Judith Rich Harris. She had a book called The Nurture Hypothesis, uh, Nurture Assumption a, a while ago. It was that kids aren't trying to please their parents. They don't actually care because you're never gonna throw them out. Kids will live or die. This is our evolutionary programming. You will live or die based on how much you impress the other people your age and your cohort. They're the ones you're going to have to cooperate with and mate with and all of that. So kids by middle school are completely obsessed with what other kids think of them. So that's the innate thing. And that's what's so nasty about social media for middle school kids is that it's hijacking this innate thing and saying, oh, you want other people to respect you? Well, don't you don't have to do anything that's worthwhile. Here, just wave your butt around on TikTok and you'll get a lot of likes and then you know, you're, you're an influencer. So I love this conversation. Um, I wanna wrap up with just one final question, uh, which is where do adults fall into this? What does coexisting with social media for us look like? Well, there's also that, that clout chasing dynamic happens to adults too. It's really not limited to kids. I mean, one of the things that I'm consistently struck by in the way that, um, that the online environment has evolved over the last, you know, seven, seven years or so maybe, um, is the rise of these kind of online factions where people, you know, kind of telegraph who they are in their bio with an emoji, right. Or, or 50 emoji for that matter. But, um, but there's such a, um, here's my identity. I'm putting it out into the world. I am absolutely, you know, and, and then there's this interesting dynamic that's happened where these identity factions have to fight each other. Also, I think John kind of alluded to this too, this, uh, you know, we're not only coexisting in space where I see your, um, rose emoji and I have a neoliberal globe emoji and we're both just coming into the space, there's automatically, you see the signifier and it's like, well, that's, that's one of those guys from that other team. And, you know, and you like expect a hostility in the interaction almost. And so there's this factionalization in how people engage. Um, and it's really been, I think, remarkable to see that come about. We used to see it from kind of niche activist groups, right? There's always, you know, social media has always been a phenomenal tool for activism. There's people who had a particular cause and they would fight for that cause and they would want to amplify that cause, make that cause trend. That's a dynamic that's been around maybe since 2011 or so, 2011, 2012 timeframe. Um, but then it's just been kind of, it's really moved into like the normie space where that is the way that people expect to behave online today. And that is the thing that I think is understudied and pretty remarkable is just the extent to which um, people feel themselves to be digital warriors for a cause today. And the, uh, it's not even necessarily the largest percentage of people online, but it's some of the most highly visible dynamics are really this kind of crowd influencer uh, fighting each other dynamic that we see on Twitter and on Facebook and, you know, to a lesser extent, some of the other platforms, YouTube, it's more like, it's almost like the old like diss tracks and rap where one posts one and then another posts one. And, you know, you have that kind of dynamic, but um, this it's, it, 
it's not necessarily the healthiest way to, to be, um, but it seems to be a thing that keeps people coming back because they are getting that dopamine hit, that, that sense of engagement, that feeling that this has given them a mission and a community and here's where they are. Yeah, I think that's a great example. It's another innate thing. That is, it's innate that we are built for tribalism, which doesn't mean we're always tribal. It means that when there's a conflict, we really lock into the level of the conflict and that becomes our identity, becomes our passion. And as a boy, I never understood team sports. I didn't, didn't like them. I thought it was a waste of time. But as an adult, at least I understand it. It's a fairly healthy way that our culture has found to activate this tribal psychology in a way that has very few negative side effects. You know, if you're in, in Britain in the 1970s and 80s, you get soccer hooligans and they like to physically beat each other over the head. That's not so good. But our sports rivalries are pretty healthy. And I think what you're pointing to, Renee, is the way this is exactly the same dynamics. This tribal dynamics is getting, it's this innate thing, which the platforms are hyperactivating and it's not playful. It's nasty and it's angry and it's, it's making it very hard to have a deliberative democracy and we can't deliberate. I think Twitter is a complete failure as the public square. It's, it's just awful. Um, but to the larger point of what do we do as adults, um, I may have been pulling our conversation more to focus on kids because that's what I've been studying. And I think the evidence of mental health harms to kids is, is the strongest. But I think um, social media is damaging the mental health of a lot of adults. I know it's done that to me at times. And in part to deal with this crazy world, I started reading Stoic writings in the morning and I found that Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus were so wise about why we should not be on social media. They sent us messages 2000 years ago. They have all these reasons why you should get off Twitter today. So I'm gonna read you one. Here's one of my favorite quotes from, um, from Epictetus. He says, if your body was turned over to just anyone, you would doubtless take exception. Why then aren't you ashamed that you have made your mind vulnerable to anyone who happens to criticize you so that it automatically becomes confused and upset? Wow. I mean, over and over again, the Stoics understood consciousness, the way we are so reactive to what people think about us and say about us, and the way that social media, again, jacks into those ancient circuits and just ramps them up and ramps them up. And most of us are worse off for it. Yeah, I guess I'll just riff off of that and talk a little bit about the way that we're not in our bodies. I mean, that's maybe one of the most incredible things about modern life is how sedentary we are, how we've now really amplified these um, these worlds inside our heads um, that we communicate with through the computer that you know are created in this virtual matrix. And we've forgotten about our bodies, and yet being in our bodies is so important and, and so... Um, such an important part of both physical health and mental health um, and you know getting back to kids but also thinking about adults and what i you know advise for my patients is anything that you can do that takes you out of your head and puts you back in your body for some period of time in the day is absolutely vital um, in the world that we live in now because of the amount of time that we are really um, just you know chin up I would urge everyone to watch the Netflix series, Black Mirror. It is so cool. And it is very much about what Anna just said, about a future in which technology has allowed us to spend much or all of our lives out of our bodies, even after we die. Yeah, and I will just add to that, that you know, one of the things I'm seeing um, clinically is more and more people reporting experiences of derealization and depersonalization. These are terms we use to describe a very, um, very unpleasant feeling of feeling like like you're not real or the world's not real and i think more and more people are experiencing that because they're living out their lives in, you know in the matrix essentially and in many cases the the persona that they've created online is um, not really consistent with their real inner experiences so they have a kind of a, a fake life online which i think can leave people feeling very untethered to themselves and contribute to anxiety and stress and, and even, you know, feelings of, of suicidality. Cause if we don't feel we're real in the world then then our life seems of little consequence. Wow. That's um, we're ending on a discussion of 
not just mental health and social media, but really everything about social media today, tribalism, um, not being present in our bodies uh, and, and getting some, some philosophy in there as well. So thank you everyone for this really great conversation. Um, in addition to the recommendation for Netflix, I'm going to recommend that everyone check out our publications uh, and works, which can be accessed in our bios. Thank you so much for joining us today.